Hello, powerful people, and welcome to the Power Hour on the Power at Work blog. I'm Seth Harris, a senior fellow at the Burns Center for Social Change. We're delighted to have you back with us on the blog. This is our very first Power Hour. Uh, it's a new blogcast on the blog, so let me tell you about what we're going to do today, present to you today. Um, the Power Hour involves in inviting two nationally recognized labor experts, and they're going to join me in talking about some of the biggest labor topics that are around today. Uh, I chose two topics, and each of our experts chose two topics, and we'll each give a brief introduction of our topic, and then we'll just engage in a conversation about them, and we'll get to as many of those six topics as we possibly can today. It's really straightforward. We think you're going to enjoy it. You'll learn a lot about labor stuff, about workers, worker power unions. Uh, and if it works well, if you like it, the Power Hour will become a regular monthly feature of the Power at Work blog. And it'll be just like our monthly uh, Numbers Day or Workers by the Numbers blogcast that my colleague Alicia Modestino hosts the first Friday of every month to talk about the jobs and unemployment report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So we're hoping that you love it and we can do it monthly. Um, but let me say, we're starting out this new feature with two powerhouse labor experts. Patricia Campos Medina is the executive director of the Worker Institute at Cornell University's School of Industrial and Labor Relations. She began working at the Worker Institute in 2015 and took over as the executive director in 2021. In addition to extensive experience as a, as a field researcher and a labor and leadership educator, Dr. Campos Medina is, has a background in politics and legislation. I won't tell you about all of it, but she was <laughs> assistant political director for SEIU, political director for Workers United. She was national legislative director for Unite before it became Unite Here. She was also there when it was Unite Here. But most important, <laughs> Dr. Campos Medina, like me, is an alum of the School of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell and love, love lifting up my fellow alums. Uh, although, let me just say, yeah, she graduated, yeah. she graduated many, 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 <laughs> many, many years after I, I was way into the labor force before she graduated. So hello, Patricia, welcome. Hello, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And yes, I'm always proud to elevate the ILR alumni at work and just continue in the tradition of promoting labor management relations uh, uh, that lead to good up, up for, for workers. So thank you for having me here. Thank you for being here. And our second nationally recognized expert is Ruth Milkman. She's a distinguished professor of sociology in the, at the City University of New York's Graduate Center, and she chairs the Labor Studies Department at CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. She's a past president of the American Sociological Association and a sociologist of labor and labor movements, and she's written very extensively about immigrant workers, organized labor, gender, labor, and inequality, auto industry restructuring and paid family and medical leave and sick leave. And I could go on and on and on and on. And we wouldn't really have much of a broadcast. I'd just be reading her <laughs> credentials. Hello, Ruth. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Seth. I'm delighted to be here. It's a pleasure. Uh, so one of the things that's especially exciting about having these two guests on the broadcast today is they each have recent research, recently released research that we're going to talk about today. And you'll be able to find that research on the Power at Work blog. We'll provide a link to their research. You can also just go to their uh, homepage is the Worker Institute and uh, CUNY's uh, School of Labor and Urban Affairs. But we'll also provide you with the links. So it's we're, we love to lift up the great work that others are doing in the labor space. Let me just say there's there's too few of us for us not to be supporting one another. That's the essence of collective action. So that's what we're doing today. Um, but I get to start us off with our first a topic. And I don't think it's going to be a surprise the UAW strike and the negotiations with the big three uh, automakers. And so let me, I, I wanna make two observations and I'd like to get both of you to respond, uh, get your comments on those observations. The first is with respect to the UAW's negotiating position. Uh, and I think it's important that we not underestimate 
what a huge directional change the UAW is trying to accomplish in these negotiations. There have been, I think it's fair to say, decades of concessions made by the UAW to the car companies. The argument always was, well, the car companies are in big trouble. So the UAW essentially had to hand them money so that they could survive and thrive. They are now surviving and thriving, and they're extremely profitable. Um, and so the UAW is trying to undo those decades of concessions. So that means that even though the press is very focused on the wage demand and the UAW is at this number and the car companies are at that number, there are a lot of other very, very important issues in there, eliminating the two-tiered system, moving from moving temporary employees to permanent employees, job security provisions, cost of living adjustments. They're all important to the union and its members. Uh, so until there's meaningful progress on all of them, not just on the wage number, I think the strike is probably not only going to continue, but going to, to ramp up. Um, and of course, those demands are being made in the context of the transition to electric vehicles. Um, and while the negotiate most of the issues at the negotiation have nothing whatsoever to do with electric vehicles, they're about that effort to get back the concessions that the UAW has made in the past. There are a couple of issues that relate to the EV the transition. Um, and so the, the UAW is trying to figure out how to balance those interests in those negotiations. So that's the first comment, the first uh, offering. The second is the UAW's strategy. So that was about the bargaining position. Mm -hmm. This one is about the strategy. So the UAW is is engaged in what it's calling a stand-up strike, which of course is a reference to the sit-down strikes of the 1930s, which was the birth of the UAW, the modern UAW. Uh, and the union is betting that it can keep a large percentage of its members working, put some of them out on strike, although interestingly, in its first choice of plants, not at sort of choke point plants that would shut down production everywhere, those are not the plants that they chose, but they their, their theory is we can put increasing levels of pressure on the big three, but start out with some pressure, but not all the pressure all at once. Um, and of course, the, the result of that is the pressure on the companies is less. And so we would expect the companies maybe to move a little bit more slowly toward the UAW's bargaining position. But we don't really know whether that strategy is going to work or not going to work. It really matters what happens at the bargaining table. That will tell us if this is a good strategy or not a good strategy. Uh, but the consequence of the strategy is also that it looks like the strike is going to last for a while. I mean, it looks like we're at least talking about weeks. Um, I'm hoping not more than that, but it, it could very well be more than that. And let me say the company's real unwillingness to move substantially in the union's direction on a number of the issues that they have out there, I think also is going to cause the, the strike to last. And let me just say, if that's right, we're going to see the union ramp up and maybe eventually get to a, a an all out strike. And the more the facilities are struck, the more the membership is going to be out of, out of money, they're going to have to rely on the strike fund. And the more pressure there is on the companies and also the auto communities in which the companies are located. So those are my, I wanted to offer those comments first about the union's negotiating position and then about the union strategy. Patricia, let me start with you. Any reactions to what I just said or just to the, to the UAW negotiations more broadly? Well, I think that the UAW um, is, I want to say benefiting because this is such a moment of, of labor strife, but it's actually exercising its power to both uh, uh, engage the workers directly in fighting for gains, but also engage in the public support for unions right now. You know, we have a high level support from the general public for union activity in general. But if you look at the recent poll, it said that most American uh, consumers are in support of workers striking at the auto plants, which tells you a little bit of where, what moment we're in society right now that people do want to see workers do better. We want, we want middle-class jobs. And in the past, working at an auto industry used to be a middle-class job, used to be a job with a career. And I think what has become obvious is that it's not anymore. So I think that uh, doing, doing the strike activity in this manner 
is demonstrating to the American public that the UAW does want to get to a settlement. They want an agreement that meets them perhaps halfway. That's a collective bargaining is. It's meeting somewhere in the middle and uh, trying to demonstrate their ability to keep the workers engaged. Now, that sounds totally opposite to what GM is doing and the auto companies are doing is basically saying, oh, we are gonna lose $14 billion if we concede to those wage demands. Uh, wait a minute, you still have $15 billion in profits if you were to have them. So that's not gonna get them any consumer or any public support, at least for now. Uh, so I think that the strategy of delaying or be looking uh, sound and reasonable is a strategy that might buy the UAW some time and perhaps help uh, the big three come to the bargaining table and realize that we, the workers have the public on their side. Yeah. Ruth, what do you think? Um, I agree with everything you both have said, really. I, I guess I would add another dimension, which is that the union, the UAW, has a new leadership that was just elected recently and is quite different from the from what it replaced and you know came to power promising to be more confrontational and militant whatever word you like um vis-a-vis -vis the companies the concession bargaining that Seth talked about goes back a long way it started in 1979 when, with the Chrysler bankruptcy and I think even then in the early 80s after the air controller strike when Reagan some of our listeners may not be old enough to remember all this, but I know the three of us probably are very aware of it. Um, that was kind of a green light to big corporations like General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, it was called then, to um, go ahead and be aggressive toward unions. And they've been doing it ever since, and they haven't stopped. Um, in the early 80s, it's true that Chrysler almost went bankrupt, but the other companies were profitable, and they demanded concessions anyway, and they got them. So this goes back a long way and the, the deterioration of these jobs that Patricia talked about from so-called middle-class jobs, I don't really like that term, but decently paid jobs with good benefits and some job security and so on, as good as it gets for a working class job in the United States. Um, they really were like that before 1979 and they've gradually deteriorated to the point where, you know, many places in the country have a $15 minimum wage and auto workers now start in some places at $17 an hour. I mean, they're yeah. not, they're not what they once were, which I think does explain the, um, it's one factor in the greater public sympathy that we're seeing. Um, I don't think the companies really care about public sympathy. They <laughs> care about their profits, which have been very high recently. Um, their excuse for not, um, you know, bowing to the union's demands is that, oh, they need all their money to do the electric car conversion. They will always have something to spend money on. I mean, I just think it's nonsense what they're saying. Um, and, but, yeah. the, you know, the, it's not clear how much leverage the UAW has in this situation. For me, the interesting comparison is to the UPS case that just a couple months ago when we thought there might be a big strike at UPS. There too, there's a new union leadership, much more militant than its predecessor, et cetera. Very similar in that regard. The difference was, in that industry, UPS is the only unionized company and the industry is booming, as we all know, thanks to Amazon, et cetera. And UPS stood to lose market share, possibly permanently, if they didn't make a deal quickly. And I think that's why they did it. Um, you know, in the auto industry, it's not really like that. They, they can hold out for a while. And so I think the prediction that it's likely to drag on for some time is is right um not just because of the union strategy but also because the companies are sitting pretty yeah they're sitting on a, yeah. i think they're sitting on an immense amount of money and uh you know what i, I i'm i'm sort of be between you and patricia a little bit on the question of whether or not public support matters you know the um i think in the near term it doesn't matter a lot but I, I, for example, I think it's doing a, uh, just going to another a labor dispute that's going on right now. I think it's harming the Hollywood studios tremendously. Um, I think both the strike is costing them hundreds and hundreds of millions, maybe billions of dollars at this point. Um, but it's also damaging their relationship with consumers. Now, it may be that the U.S. automakers don't have to worry about that consumer sentiment quite as much. But I always think they sort of have their eye on it a little bit, partly because there are some individual shareholders out there 
and there are some pension funds out there. Uh, and so they care about capital, but also, you know, car buyers, you know, maybe they're, maybe the, the automakers view is we're the only union companies in town, go ahead and buy a Nissan, go ahead and buy a VW, go ahead and buy a Tesla. You're not going to do that if you're somebody who really cares about unions. So I don't know, Patricia, you wanted to jump in. No, yes, what I, and, and I totally agree with you, it's not clear at this moment. We, we all just sort of, if we had a crystal clear ball, we can say how, how things were going to go, we'd be, uh, we'd be geniuses. But what I, what is interesting to me um, is how in the whole discussion of, cons of consumers and the public, uh, there's, there's very little discussion about the actual cost of the, the labor costs in the price tag of a car. Um, no, reporters don't report on it. You know, they don't, they say the workers should want, want more and they will make it more expensive for consumers. But if you look at it, uh, I think it was one of the UAW workers that was being interviewed. He actually said, and it's true, that the labor cost for a car in the sticker price is only about 6%. So there's a lot of growth that, that they can put on that, on the labor cost and still keep the cars at the same price. And so mm -hmm. this argument that they're making that if they increase, they I see to the wages, they're gonna drive out the cost. There's, there's a lot of room to grow there. And I think we need to continue to educate consumers that is actually uh, um, the three big companies just have to decide to, redu to take less profits and, and give it back and, and rather than just put it to the shareholders, actually invest it in the workforce. I mean, we used to have, you know, the big four, right? Henry Ford used to say he wanted his, it's the people who work for him to be able to afford the cars they built. And it is a shame that we are, we have three big corporate leaders basically not caring if, uh, if their, if their workers go buy a, a, a Nissan or a Toyota. I mean, to me, that, that is uh, the ep epitome of lack of corporate responsibility. Um, specifically for companies that were bailed out by the American public in 2009, uh, that they don't have and, and that they don't have that responsibility to give back. And this is a specific case for me where government intervention is clear. It, it, we need government intervention to get this to get these companies to actually give more to workers. And it's not clear what, what the Biden administration is going to do at this moment because. I mean, we hope that he takes the position you know, to, to demand more for workers. But either way, it's a, it's a tricky political decision that he has to make. But we are in a point where we need government intervention to actually demand more for corporations that are basically uh, subsidized by American taxpayers. So why don't we ask them to, sub, to actually pay workers better wages? Great. Okay, let's move on to topic number two. And Ruth, I'm going to turn to you. You have recently put out the latest edition of your Union Density Report, National, New York State, and New York City. Tell us about the report and tell us about some things that we should know from it. Sure. Thanks, Seth, for featuring this. So at CUNY, we um, every Labor Day, we put out this report. So this is, I don't know, number 12 or something. And before I was at CUNY, I did the same thing in California, where I used to teach at UCLA, and then it was California. And anyway. Um, so it's basically taking publicly available data from the U.S. Current Population Survey and sort of crunching the numbers to give a more detailed portrait than the government publishes of the trends in unionization rates and, you know, along every possible dimension that we were able to capture. So that includes, you know, how unionization breaks out by different industries and occupations, by different demographic groups, geographically, et cetera. Um, Partly, this, these reports taken as a whole, the whole series of them, unfortunately, chronicle the kind of continuing erosion of union density in the United States, which has been going on for quite a long time, longer than we've been doing these reports, actually, but <laughs> that's in there. Um, the other thing that's very striking to anyone looking at it for the first time is that New York, both the city and the state, have roughly doubled the union density of the nation. That's true in both the public and the private sector. So, you know, that's sort of for historical well, that's not really right that it's historical reasons, because there was a time, if you go back to the 1950s, when union density nationally was at its peak, New York was not that different from the rest of the country, but now it is. Um, and we could speculate about why that might be. The only other thing I want to say by way of introduction is that 
um, I, I don't know who the audience for this broadcast is. I think people who are really kind of in the weeds on the in the labor stuff know this, what I'm about to say, but the general listener might not, which is that when you see these numbers and, um, for example, notice that um, Black workers have a higher union unionization rate than other workers. Um, that it, it is true, actually, in that case, that Black workers are more pro-union. If you look at attitudinal polls about what people think about unions, they actually are. But that's not why their unionization rate is higher. It's because of which jobs they are concentrated in. Our labor market remains, despite all the civil rights legislation that's been around for more than half a century, remains highly segregated by gender, race, and a few other things. And so what determines whether you're in a union is really in, in a nation where only 10% of the workforce is unionized and only 6% in the private sector. Um, what determines it is really where you're employed. If you happen to work in a place that nobody's ever tried to unionize or never succeeded in doing so, you could be the most fervently pro-union person in the country and still not be a union member. Conversely, you might work in a in say a public sector job where pretty much everybody is a member of the union. You don't have to be, but you know you're likely. That's the kind of default, and um, you might not be particularly pro union. So it really is all about where people work, and that is shaped by a lot of different factors. Um, so it's a very uneven phenomenon, not just geographically, but also in terms of some industries are much more unionized than others transportation, utilities, for example, are very highly unionized. You could argue they're, even though they're technically private sector, they're sort of quasi-public in some ways. That might be part of the reason. Um, retail, finance are almost completely non-union. Um, and in New York, that matters because it's a center for that kind of work. So um, maybe I could start with that and see what you guys have to say. Great. Tricia, why don't you make the first comment? Uh this report is always um, lays out, you know, what's happening in New York State in terms of union. We always look at New York State uh, as leading the way in efforts to unionize or legislation to unionize in California, our second, uh, another area where very pro-union, pro-immigrant, -immig pro pro-worker legislation comes out. So this report uh, oh, help us understand what's actually happening with union power. So it's, it's very informative, but it also helps us uh, help union leaders understand, uh, you know, that it, just because we have 20% union density, that's not enough. We need to figure out where are the union, union density happening? Where is declining? What are the jobs that perhaps will benefit from union uh, organizing so that we can uh, keep these these numbers growing. So it's a it's an effort. It's a it's a report that helps us inform uh, a strategy for what the union should be doing. And I always I always look forward to it, Ruth, when when you put it out, so that to see what has changed and what how we we need to pivot uh, to support uh, the different organizing that is happening. Because that's the most exciting thing that's happening in New York State for me. And if you look at the ILR uh, labor activity labor action tracker. You can see that we have uh, union that has stay, has stay stable, but union activity and union actions have increased um, across the country, but in New York State, and we need to pay attention to that as well. Yeah, uh, so I, I I'm going to agree with that. Go ahead, Ruth. Oh, I was just going to say I agree completely with the point about the new activity that's been emerging, and I think it's been very heavily covered in the media. So I'm sure anybody listening to this is aware that, you know, they're organizing it's Amazon, Starbucks, Trader Joe's, Apple, and so on. Um, unfortunately, the scale of that has been relatively modest and has not yet moved the needles on unionization rates overall. So as the report, the depressing feature of this report is that <laughs> density, even in New York, is actually declining. In the one, it, we do a special feature every year, which I won't get into in detail, except to mention that the one a year ago focused on the new organizing, and we showed that actually New York was kind of a leader in a lot of that. Um, but again, it wasn't extensive enough to really um, reshape the big picture. And you know that might change in the future, but so far, unfortunately, yeah. uh, that's yeah. the situation. So, 
In fact, we see a decline in both public and private sector um, in the last couple of years, post pandemic or whatever. Right. In, in, in density, I wanted to, uh, I'll just make, this is just a throwaway point. <laughs> I, I feel like we're too negative uh, when we talk only about union density, because last year, according to our friends at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there was actually an increase in the total number of union members in the United States by about 280,000, which is a huge number of union members. Um, now, the union density rate went down because the denominator, you talked about the numerator, Ruth, I'm going to pretend I know something about math and talk about the denominator. <laughs> the denominator has grown so dramatically. There have been 13 and a half million new jobs under President Biden. And so keeping up with that rate of jobs growth, the labor movement just hasn't been able to do it. But, you know, for the first time since 2017, the absolute number of union members grew. There was growth in the public sector as well as the private sector, the local government sector shrunk a little bit. State government did a lot better. Federal government did much, much better. And I think it will continue to grow fairly dramatically. But I, Ruth, I, I got to I asked you, we talked a little bit about this before we started. Uh, so I was really surprised by the steep decline in private sector unionization in both New York State and New York City, particularly New York City, because I think people think that, you know, everybody in New York is a union member, right? That's the, <laughs> the stereotype of New York State. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to reverse the lyric from the famous song and say, if you can't make it here, you can't make it anywhere. What? How do you explain the steep decline? Or I know that there is a statistical or, or data issue that plays a role here that has to do with the pandemic. So I'd like you to explain that. But then are we seeing a real substantial and steep decline in the private sector in new york so the answer we are nationally yeah. and nationally is you're right we're at six percent i'm sorry to interrupt go ahead oh that's okay um well there's a lot going on in the in the numbers there's some some of it is a statistical artifact um so let me just explain the only data that are collected regularly on union membership come from this thing called the current population survey which is a household survey so the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics contacts households, asks them a series of questions about whether anybody in the household is employed, and if so, what jobs do they have, on and on. And one of the questions is, are you a union member? Another one is, are you covered by a union contract? When we break it out geographically, the geography is based on where people live, which may or may not correspond to where they work. So in New York City, which has legendarily high housing costs, um, there are a lot of people who commute to jobs in New York City from New Jersey, Connecticut, upstate New York, wherever, right? They are not appearing in the data for New York City because they don't live in the city. So that's one thing that's kind of creating this sense that there's a decline. I, there probably is a decline, but it may not be as big as it appears because especially in the height of the pandemic period, a lot of people moved out of the city and some have come back, but not, you know, some haven't. Mm -hmm. So they might still work in the city. They might work remotely. You know, there's all kinds of different possibilities there. Um, so that, you know, that's one piece. In the public sector, there's another factor that I think is part of it, which is also related to the pandemic, which is um, the kind of, delayed effect of the Janus de decision, the Supreme Court decision that um, made it illegal for um, public sector unions to collect fair representation fees from um, public employees who might choose not to join the union. Now they don't have to pay anything and they can choose not to join the union. Well, during the lockdowns, it was very difficult for unions to reach out to new workers or for that matter, people who had been around for a while and say, and, and try to educate them about why it might be in their interest to join the union and pay the dues and all that, and that, that would strengthen the organization over the long term. When Janus first became the law of the land, they did that, and they actually, there was not much effect initially. But I think with the pandemic and the difficulty of making contact of that kind, um, I know in my own union, the PSC, I've talked to some of the officers, and I that, that's the professional staff Congress, which represents CUNY staff and faculty, this has definitely been a problem, and I suspect it's the case in a lot of other public sector unions. So, so there's just kind of a lot going on in the numbers. Um, and I think your point about the absolute number of union members versus the, 
the numerator denominator thing is also really important to understand. It's a big country. We have over 150 million workers. So a couple hundred thousand doesn't really cut it in terms of, again, changing the big picture. It's important. It's, you know, and well, I'll just say one more thing. If we go back to and look at the history of unionization, um, one thing that becomes really clear once you look at the long term is that unionization doesn't really grow like one workplace at a time. I mean, it can, but it comes in big waves. So the most dramatic, of course, was the 1930s when the law changed and the National Labor Relations Act was passed and gave workers the, for the first time the legal right to collective bargaining. And there's this huge upsurge in the years that follow, basically the decade that follows that going up to the end of World War II and actually continues for a while longer, but that's like the really big one. Similarly, in the public sector, when collective bargaining laws get passed in many states, not all to this day, but quite a few, starting in 1959 with Wisconsin, you start to see a big upsurge in public sector unions and that wasn't there before. So it's not like an incremental process. There has to be some kind of seismic shift in the labor market yeah, that leads yeah. to that. And, you know, there's a chance that all the activity we're seeing now is the beginning of something like that. I think it's too soon to know, but but that's how it changes. It's not a couple hundred thousand union members at a time, even much less one Starbucks or one, you know, Trader Joe's or whatever. Yeah, you're just, you are just not going to let me be optimistic, no matter what <laughs> I say. But, um, go ahead, Patricia. And then yeah. we're going to get on to topic three. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I think that, um, sorry, I totally agree that there's ways of union organizing and that that's when we see a, a big, a big influx. And I think we're going through a wave of union organizing right now. And hopefully it will lead to uh, upsourcing union membership. The problem that we have is that for so long we have had an NLRB and an NLRA that wasn't acting in, in favor of workers or wasn't ruling in favor of workers. And it, it's not able to force corporate America to the bargaining table. And so, you know, the, the recent ruling by the NLRB basically uh, mandating an employer to actually if they don't comply, that they will face penalties. I think that that's a change that we that the labor movement has been demanding uh, that to for that there has to be teeth in the NLRA for for corporate America to comply. And otherwise, you know, Amazon will continue to uh, to lag their feet, and Starbucks will continue to lag their feet, and and we will not get to an actual collective bargaining agreement and with the union members paying dues, which is when their numbers go up. So I think that we we will continue to see union organizing activity. We hope we hope that that will keep workers engaged so that we can get another a, uh, another term of uh, of uh, labor friendly administration so that we can actually get to some actual labor law reform that put teeth in the NLRB to hold employers accountable for failing to bargain in good faith. Boy, so so that's optimistic. Labor <laughs> law reform. Wow. <laughs> yes. I didn't think I didn't think we were going to go there. Okay. Let's go to topic number 3. Patricia, your worker institute has issued a report on prevailing wage. Uh, there's a new prevailing wage law in New York state. So tell us about the report. Tell us what it found. So prevailing wage is one of those things that uh most most uh people don't really understand how it works, what it is, uh, why does it matter? Uh, but in, a, in an economy like New York City, where uh, you know, construction and construction size uh, is such a big um, employer, is a driver of employment, uh, issues of prevailing wage and uh, um, apprenticeships and wage theft that really provide the ability for, uh, for workers in the construction industry to have good jobs, this is important. So we were trying to figure out how, what is the impact, what first we need, we wanted to define what prevailing wage is and why does it matter uh, in creating a, a um, opportunity for good jobs for workers. So a prevailing wage is defined as the hourly wage benefits and overtime paying to workers within a particular region. Uh, that if you are in a construction industry, if you are a bidder that's bidding for a, a, to build a construction site, uh, if that project was funded to public monies, 
you have to pay a prevailing wage for the region determined by that city, by the county, by the region. So what New York State did is that it expanded the definition of prevailing wage to also include private sector developers and private sector con construction projects that have an input of 30% of public funds. So that expanded the number of projects in New York City and New York State that are, are, are covered under the prevailing wage mandate of New York State. That has the potential of uh, increasing the ability of, of unions to actually demonstrate what the union advantage is for, um, for uh, contractors, construction uh, employers to engage with uh, and, and, and support union jobs and union construction sites. So what we were trying to do at the Worker Institute is to actually create a formula or a way to easily demonstrate that if you have, uh, if, if now that all construction projects that are supported for public funds are expected to be covered, what is the union advantage of, of uh, using union contractors uh, on, a, on a work site? So what we found is that now, there's two levels of that, that we can uh, uh, create a union advantage. One is that, uh, workplaces, construction sites that are under a prevailing wage with a union contractor are in the majority safer workplaces. Uh, they're prone to less accidents and uh, less incidents of, uh, of, uh, of uh, accidents on the job and therefore have a lower cost of compensation of, of uh, worker comp insurance. So that reduces the cost of, uh, for, of uh, of, of a contractor to engage uh, in, in, the, in, in the industry. Um, you know, New York City alone just last year had over 22 deaths uh, of construction workers. That's 22 families. Over 500 incidents of injuries uh, in the industry. That increases the workers' compensation insurance for those companies and also increases their cost. But it also, you know, it's, 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 it's tragic to think of 500 families actually being permanently disabled for the construction industry. Uh, mo the majority of those accidents occur on non-union uh, non construction sites. So making them, making them more, uh, more dangerous space. So that's one area of, of the union advantage in the construction industry. The other one is, is that by engaging with union contractors and union firm, you're also getting a more, um, you are investing in a more trained uh, workforce because part of the, comp of the compensation or the fringe benefits that unions uh, provide is access to um, worker employer trained um, apprenticeship programs. And that creates the opportunity for a construction job to be a career and a skilled job. Now, through our work on equity that we do at the Worker Institute, we're also measuring equity outcomes on, 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 the, um, on, on training programs in the construction industry. So there's a lot of work to do to make sure that those uh, apprenticeships are creating equity outcomes. But if we don't have apprenticeships at the construction sites, we actually are not creating a career path for those jobs. So we connect prevailing wage through safe, through better safety outcomes on the job and also to better career outcomes for workers through apprenticeships and good jobs in the construction industry, which, as you know, has, I always say that construction job has been the, the, uh, the gig economy job that has always existed in our country. It's always been a gig job to have a construction job, but through unions, uh, construction jobs became career jobs and, and jobs with benefits. And I think that even as we do all our work on the other areas of the gig economy, that we ought to learn from how the construction unions were able to create benefits and fresh benefits and workers' compensation and a career and training opportunities for workers. So that's what we were trying to do with this prevailing wage report. It's very extensive. It has a lot of math. If you're a math wonk, and, and but we are able to show uh, what is the union advantage of, uh, of engaging with union contractors so that you can comply with the prevailing wage mandate uh, in New York State today. So I'll stop Perfect. there.
No, no, Patricia, it's a good bet that very few members of the Power at Work audience are math wonks, um, <laughs> except for perhaps some of the PhD students at the ILR school. So Ruth, comments on, on prevailing wage and, uh, and the new law. Um, I, I mean, the new law maybe will help to kind of stem the tide, but the here I go as Cassandra again, like in their <laughs> earlier chat. I've sort of seen this movie before because I used to live in Los Angeles where, which once back in the 1960s and 70s was wall-to-wall -wall unionized in the construction industry. And now it's basically collapsed in residential construction, which is a lot of the construction out there, um, housing construction and the commercial, there's still some that's unionized, but it's just really um, undergone a very, very sharp decline. And the challenge is, you know, to keep to keep um, what economists call taking wages out of competition is key to the survival of construction unions. Um, you need to, it's the, it's the rare industry where employers, contractors who are part of, who, who employ union workers talk about the union in the first person, like us in the union, they'll say, mm -hmm. um, and the, and their employers, because it's in their interest too. And for all the reasons you said, not just safety, the skill level of the workers that they hire, but it, it stabilizes the industry if uh, if the bulk of it is unionized. And the challenge is to keep it that way um, and to not allow the big developers who would prefer to operate non-union if they can get away with it, even in New York, they're trying. That's really what's yeah. going on. Um, to to um, coordinate the interests of the contractors who actually benefit from a stable labor force in the industry if they can make it happen. But once they're being underbid by non-union contractors and that's who the developers are hiring, it becomes a kind of downward race to the bottom thing. And this law is, you know, a counter move to that trend, but that is the trend we've been seeing recently. And um, I just hope it doesn't go the way of California. Yeah. I, so I, one of the things I really appreciated about this report is the focus on why it's advantageous to use unions, and I particularly like the focus on registered apprenticeship, because it contrasts a high road strategy versus a low road strategy. What, what Ruth is just talking about is the low road strategy, pay low wages, people float in and out of the industry, you, you can't really rely on them, you don't know what their skill level is. The overwhelming majority of skilled, trained apprenticeship graduates are union members because they come out of labor management apprenticeship programs. Um, so the low road strategy is low wages, no benefits, unsafe and unhealthy workplaces because that costs money to keep places yeah. healthy and safe. And then the other version, the high road strategy is you have this training strategy where folks stay in apprenticeship, are paid a lower wage, but they're guaranteed a job at the back end as journey people. And you have journey people supervising them. So you have this skills talent pipeline that guarantees that the industry is going to get really well-qualified people who are going to do a fantastic job and you're not going to end up with problematic buildings. But um, the problem is that the upfront costs that prevailing wage laws try to equalize, as, as Ruth said, taking wages out of competition, that's what contractors are bidding on. And that's one of the hard things to explain to folks about the importance of prevailing wage laws is that when the government puts out a request for at bids, right, a request for proposals yeah. on a mm -hmm. contract, everybody thinks they're going to win if they cut their prices as low no. as they possibly can. And what prevailing wage laws do is put a floor underneath that and give all firms, particularly unionized firms, an opportunity to compete on these other grounds. So I, I, the, the report did a great job of explaining that. It did a great job of explaining the health and safety difference, the workers' comp difference, the apprenticeship difference. I really like that. But you know, at the end of the day, you one you worry, and I, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> apparently not as pessimistic as Ruth about all things. But in this, I really worry that in the absence of a law, or even if you have a law that doesn't go far enough, that we're going to end up with this race to the bottom. I hate to be so negative about it because I thought the report was very compelling. Yeah, and the report, what it's trying to make is an argument to uh, policymakers that what, they do, the, what they're do, what they doing in demanding uh, you know, uh, 
prevailing wage jobs in their bidding process, that, that is good public policy because at least it sets the expectation that, uh, that the bidders will not compete based on the lower labor cost. They can compete on something else. But, you know, a prevailing wage law, even as strong as it is right now in New York State, doesn't really uh, uh, turn into safer workplaces or more union members if it's not, in, the, the enforcement part is, you know, it's, uh, it's key always, right? You know, how are you making sure that once you have a bid in place that you're actually um, uh, categorizing workers in the right jobs, you know, uh, in, in the independent contract and the categorization of workers is, is a is very real issue in, in New York State, in the New York City construction industry. Workers get categorized wrong all the time and they get put on, you know, in lower categories that are paid less. So that is the administration of the, of the prevailing wage is also important. But our aim at the Working Institute is always to say, this is why this policy is good. This is the enforcement mechanisms that you need. But at the end, if we don't regulate uh, a, a, a wage floor for, for, uh, for workers, then we're always gonna be uh, a wage to the bottom. And that is just not good for public, for, public uh, for, for, for New York City or for the country to begin with. And specifically at this moment where we have so much investment in public infrastructure coming both from the federal government uh, and from the state, you know, to try to uh, create jobs. So let's make sure that we create jobs that at least are above the wage floor and create a career path for people. So, and that is the organizing. I always said, I, we can know, a law is only a law. Uh, it doesn't turn into a right until people exercise it in, either through a union or through an organize, organize, organization that helps them demand, implement Great. the law. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're running short on time, but I think we have enough time, at least for one more topic, I might try to squeeze in too. Um, <laughs> and Ruth, this is your topic. Uh, and, and you asked a question, is the increase in worker organizing, worker activism and strikes sustainable, or are we going to see it drop off? So I've learned the hard way that predicting the future is a very hazardous <laughs> enterprise. So I'm not really going to try to do that, but I just want to sort of break out some of the activity that we're seeing. And I think it falls into a, a, a bunch of distinct categories. So the most, what's gotten the most attention, well, maybe right now the UAW strike is getting the most attention, but, and that's important. But if we just think back over the last few years, what's gotten the most attention is this um, organizing at these iconic companies, Amazon, Starbucks, Apple, et cetera. And, you know, understandably, everybody knows what those companies do and people see, you know, there's something going on there that's interesting and potentially worth supporting. And there is public support for all of it. Um, what struck me about that whole phenomenon is the demographic group that's leading it. And it's overwhelmingly led by younger workers who are have college education or sometimes beyond college education. They're the leaders. They're not always the rank and file workers in those places, but actually Starbucks baristas tend to be college educated, believe it or not. Certainly yeah. Apple store retail workers are, et cetera. Um, and so why is that? I think we can trace it back to the impact of, well, the growth of inequality more generally and the deterioration of job security in the country, but particularly to the Great Recession. Um, the young workers who are leading all this are mostly people who enter the labor market in the aftermath of the Great Recession. They, you know, they did what they were supposed to do. They went to school, they graduated from college, whatever, and then they face that labor market where often the only job they can get is a barista job or something like that. So there's this enormous gap between the expectations that they enter the labor market in and um, the reality that they face in the workplace. So that's a recipe for turning to unions. But why turning to unions? I think there's another thing that changed um, in the early 20th century, and that is the political worldview of this generation. Um, this is the generation that was infatuated with Barack Obama in 2008, supported him overwhelmingly, you know, much more than any other age group. Um, they then came the, what I just described, the labor market effects of the Great Recession and um, a sort of political disappointment merged with the uh, um, economic disappointment there. They 
I mean, I think Obama tried, but he was not really able to fix that situation um, for them. And meanwhile, we saw the emergence of a new new left. The new left is the my generation's left. Now we're seeing a new new left of made up of millennials, Gen Zers, et cetera. Um, again, disproportionately college educated. I did some research back in 2011 on Occupy Wall Street. That's when I first noticed this phenomenon. We did a little survey of the occupiers and they were overwhelmingly young and college educated. Those were the leaders. And the same, and now that, and at that time there wasn't much going on in terms of labor activity among that demographic, but now they've gotten the labor bug, if you will, and are, you know, very pro-union. The polls all show that young educated workers are the most pro-union, even in a time when the public as a whole is increasingly supportive of unionization. So there's something going on there. But in terms of the question you raised is, is this all sustainable? There, I think, to, you know, we need to look at what's happening on the employer end. And what we're seeing, unfortunately, is, you know, intransigent anti-unionism on the part of these companies, Amazon and Starbucks, above all. Um, some, some of the people listening to this might have watched Howard Schultz's performance when Bernie Sanders subpoenaed him before the um, Congress. And, you know, he basically said, I'm not doing anything wrong. I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. So can they? And just like, you know, denied the reality that he his company is breaking the law every day, firing people for organizing, which is illegal under the 1935 National Labor Relations Act and on and on. However, so I'm not sure what the future of it is at those companies. I mean, the lesson people are seeing is, yeah, you can organize, you can win an election, but then nothing happens. And that's not going to inspire a lot of imitation. On the other hand, that same generation is also organizing in settings where they have a lot more leverage because they are much harder to replace. So I'm thinking of my own industry, higher education, college adjuncts, um, graduate student workers who've been organizing a lot recently. Um, journalists actually are doing it. They're also in that same situation. They're, you can't just fire all the journalists at a newspaper and hire people off the street. You know, they require quite a bit of training. Museum workers, staffs of nonprofits. Recently, we've seen interns and residents organizing. There, I think there's a lot more staying power um, because the employer just doesn't have the ability to get rid of them all and start over or close the hospital. They're not going to do that because some interns and residents organized nurses right. too. So, yeah. um, so I don't know. To me, that's where that where the <laughs> action is. Um, yeah. And I think yeah. you now, given the generational infatuation with labor. Insofar as they figure out that this is where they can really make strides forward, I I am optimistic about that piece of it. Not so much. Hey, about... hey, yeah. I feel I like we accomplished. I feel like we accomplished something. All right, Patricia, what do you think? Is is what we're seeing now? Worker organizing, worker activism, strike activity. Is it sustainable over the long term? I think it's here to stay for a lo for for the long term, uh, and I agree with the observations. Of, for Ruth, but I also want to add that there is a, in addition to the gender and the age component, there is a race component as to who is out there organizing. And it's, uh, it's workers of color, uh, it's women of color who are organizing and demanding more young, or young workers of color, so LGBTQ plus communities out there organizing. So that diversity is, is key because those are being the workers that for a long time were in some instances excluded from the labor movement because of many reasons, inability of the labor movement to sort of get itself together to respond to the changes in the workforce and the changes in our economy. But those are the workers who are organizing and are actively organizing. And some of them, I would say, yes, were inspired by Obama, but also inspired by the Bernie revolution, you know? Oh, absolutely. And, yeah, yeah, Bernie got them to vote and organize and demand more. Actually, he got them to believe that more was possible, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that we see in that um, driving uh, who's organizing, who is actually petitioning for union, who's leading the organizing drive is more diverse, young people of color. And that's exciting to me because it has the potential to also transform the, the labor movement and make it more uh, transformational in their approach to unionization. So, and that would give me into the other subject that I was gonna talk about is how uh, we, uh, women, women of color are actually demanding tra structural transformation 
in the care economy, in how we treat nurses and hospitals, in how we actually address these issues on, on time scheduling. Before the pandemic, everybody, it was, it was, it, we couldn't challenge on time scheduling as a, as a saving mechanism for, for Pro America, but it was actually creating an additional burden on women and women of color. Uh, we're also now talking about the cost of, uh, of the lack of care on care workers. Like there's mo most nurses or most care workers in the, uh, even doctors themselves have very limited access to healthcare themselves. And what are the implications for that? So the whole debate about making care jobs, good jobs, and we can define what a good job is, um, that is also transformational because it's demanding uh, at, uh, a structural change in that industry from the focus of women and women of color who has been traditionally been seen as, uh, as non-essential in that industry. And we at the Worker Institute are dedicating a lot of work to figuring out what is the future of care work that focuses on the race uh, and the gender dynamics of care work uh, as a reason why it has always been underpaid and undervalued. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to violently agree with both of you or actually politely agree with both of you not violently um but i also i want to add a a point to it because i am also inclined to be optimistic in this in regard to whether or not what we're seeing right now the worker activism and organizing is sustainable um you know my parents were depression babies and the experience that they lived through as as young people as kids and then teenagers because it was a long depression really defined a significant part of the rest of their lives. Uh, they they ended up being public school teachers, partly because there was economic security there. They ended up, they had pensions. It was really a great career for them after, you know, they flipped a little bit back and forth between careers before that, but ultimately that was where they landed. And it was because it provided them with economic security. And boy, could my mom squeeze every drop of value out of a <laughs> yeah. penny. I mean, they, she was, and, and it was, as a result, left a lot, left a lot of money uh, when she passed at the age of 94, partly because she had a pension. But the, the Great Depression was a defining moment. I, I, I'm inclined to agree with Ruth and also with you, Patricia, that the, the Great Recession and the pandemic recession and the pandemic itself were defining moments for this generation and maybe the next generation as yeah. well. It was extremely frightening. And it was frightening to see employers failing, supply chains failing, the medical system failing, and government failing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that um, in some cases spawned a right-wing populism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of people who really want to solve the problems in their lives, it generated a progressive populism that caused them to turn to their neighbors, turn to their coworkers and say, the way we're going to solve these problems is with one another by building power and doing what we need, need to do. And in an era when we're really stuck in Washington, D.C., and there's a lot of polarization, not just in state capitals, but in the country as a whole, and the institutions that people used to feel they could depend on failed them and still to a large extent are failing them. I think that there is a, a general sense that if we're going to do things differently, we're going to have to do it ourselves. And I think the organizing that you're talking about, Patricia, particularly among women of color in, in industries that have long been left behind, that have long been ignored, but them demanding the focus that they need, demanding the resources that they need with the help of unions and advocacy groups, is a very, very good illustration of that. Yeah. The argument that government will solve it is an argument I think that a lot of people just are skeptical about now. And the argument that big business and the markets are going to solve it, the argument that prevailed in the 1980s into the 1990s, I think that argument has been largely rejected by the American people now. Now, it doesn't last forever. The Great Depression Maybe, arguably, the effects of that lasted into the 1950s when we had the peak of trade unionism, we had the growth of the civil rights movement, um, but maybe, you know, in the 1960s, that began to fall apart. So I'll take 20, 25, 30 years of greater <laughs> activism, greater organizing, and let's see where we end up. But let me say, there are powerful forces trying to stop this movement yes. right now, yes. and, uh, and we're going to have to see how it plays out. And sadly... 
I am the not so powerful force that has to stop this broadcast because I could keep going. I knew that this was going to be fantastic. And I'm so grateful to Ruth Milkman and Patricia Campos Medina for participating today, joining us. Go to the websites of CUNY's School of Labor and Urban Affairs. Go to the website of the Worker Institute and the School of Industrial Labor Relations at Cornell. Get their studies. We will have them on the blog. But while I have you, let me just say, this blogcast and all of our blogcasts are available from every uh, provider of podcasts that there is. Spotify, Google, Apple. It's available also on our website. So if you want to listen to us in the car, for goodness sakes, don't watch us. Listen to us on a podcast. Download the podcast and listen to us. And please connect with us on social media. We're on X, I guess we're going to call it X, <laughs> Facebook, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, TikTok. We're available all those places. It's either Power at Work or at Power at Work blog. Please connect with us. Let us know what you thought about this blogcast and all of our blogcasts. Let me thank our guests again for the terrific job that they did today. And we will see you back on the blog again very soon. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Seth.